think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. As we hurdle towards a high-tech future where everything seems possible, a growing number of people are choosing to correct what they're convinced was nature's big mistake. I've been a cat my entire life. On the inside of my head, I do live life as a tiger. They're asking, why be human when you know you're not? There's nothing wrong with primates except that I'm not one. They're pushing the boundaries of body modification. If a surgeon were to actually perform the kind of work that I perform, they would lose their license. And challenging nature's limits, carving and covering their flesh. I could see having my ears pointed and my earlobes removed. Trying to escape their human prison. Let go my tail. Trying to free the animal within. In this house, just outside of San Diego, lives a cat with another cat, unlike any other cat you've ever seen. Dennis Avner is a 44-year-old Native American man who goes by the name Catman. Or to his friends, just plain cat. Cat's life dream is to transform himself into a tiger, and he's well on the way. I've been a cat my entire life. I've always related to cats. I've always had a... Uh close relationship with cats. I can walk into somebody's house who has cats and go right up to their cats and we're instant friends. But uh, that also works with uh, uh, wild cats, uh, uh, tigers, other animals. Uh, I have a very strong instant relationship with them. Cats had 12 operations in the last six years. His latest implanted metal studs just above his upper lip to hold nylon whiskers. It takes a half hour to put them in, half hour or more, and a half hour or more to uh, take them back out. So I like them, they look great, but uh, it's a major pain to do it very often. Usually just special occasions that I do them for. Cat began transforming himself 25 years ago, first with tattoos, then with surgery. The first modification I did, we started with the ears uh, some time ago. Uh, they've actually been done three times, three different procedures to get to this point. The teeth were going to be done as caps, but they ended up having to be done as dentures because my teeth were in pretty bad shape. Then uh, we did the implant in here and the bridge of my nose to change the profile to make it more cat-like. And uh, along with that, we cleft the lip to make it more cat-like. Uh, there's been uh, silicone injected my uh, upper lip and my cheeks and my chin to uh, change the shape of my face a little more. And I had to get that done in Mexico because that's, I uh, can't legally do that in the United States. Cat has a well-paying job as a computer technician. Most of what he earns, he spends on becoming more tiger-like. I really don't want to know how much I spent on all this because it's a lot of money. I mean, it's like, I got better things to do than keep track of how much I spend. I just, I'm moving forward. I'm, I don't care about what's behind me. But Cat isn't transforming his body in a plastic surgery clinic. No plastic surgeon he contacted would even consider working on it. The man who's turning Cat into a tiger works in this house in Phoenix. But he isn't a doctor. My background is medical device design, medical instrument manufacturing, implant manufacturing, implant design, stuff like that. In 1999, the Guinness Book of World Records cited Steve Hayworth as the most successful body modification artist in the world. I've done probably 95% of the extreme modification that's walking around. I've modified people to look like uh, fairies and elves and pixies, uh, cats, reptiles. Cat is the extreme end of the scale. He, uh, he has taken his modifications to the point that he is uh, almost not of this world. It is so extreme and so unhuman-like 
that you, you can't you can't expect people to not be completely shocked and floored and in awe at what they see. All right, Tiger Man. How long have you been doing that? Uh, a little over 20 years. Do you like it? I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't like it. That's pretty good. Experts on the human condition say the world has never seen anything like the dedicated efforts of people like Cat to become another animal. Well, it's an interesting concept, trans species. It's sort of like uh, taking transsexualism to one additional degree, really. Uh, it's a novel idea. Most people haven't thought about it. It certainly hasn't come into our diagnostic and statistical manual, so it's not a recognized condition, for example. Many traditional cultures imitate animals, especially animals they believe are crucial to their survival, temporarily transforming themselves with masks and makeup. They stage elaborate ceremonies to honor animals they hold sacred. But experts say no one has ever gone as far as cat. In indigenous cultures, there would never be a person who would completely take on the persona of an animal and live this animal 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is something that, that is a new thing, and I think it has a lot to do with the distance of Western cultures from nature, and it's a way to bring nature into our lives. I think at a very like very young age, I was pretty convinced that I wasn't really supposed to, you know, look like everybody else. That I was there was something else that, you know, that I was supposed to do. 24-year-old Becky Bulow calls herself the Leopard Girl. For six years, she's been tattooing her body with leopard spots to complement her feline features. I've been told that I have very feline eyes that my upper cheekbones, you know, uh, being that they arch so much, that it's very cat-like. The fact that I have no eyebrows, you know, gives for a very, you know, sloped head. <laughs> for Becky, tattooing's become an addiction. Four, six, eight, ten. She'd no idea Twelve, she'd take 15, the leopard spots this far. Fifteen? Fifteen? <laughs> I've had 15 sessions done, uh, about 40 hours. I could definitely say that, you know, for quite a while, it was like an incredible addiction. I couldn't go to a tattoo show and smell green soap without, like, wanting, you know, feeling like I wanted to get tattooed, so. And it was Becky's grandmother who started her on the path of transforming herself into a leopard. When I was growing up, my grandmother, uh, she named all of the grandchildren, and she gave them each an, a specific animal. Uh, my sister was a bear, my, uh, one of my cousins was a turtle, the other one was a butterfly, and I was the mouse. I was kind of a wild child, so they were always chasing me around. And probably around the age of 15, I just started realizing more and more that the older I got, that I was tired of being chased. You know, so the 100, you know, the 360 from a mouse is a cat. Uh, my, favorite, my favorite big cat was the leopard. There's nothing that particularly draws me to the pattern. It's just what, you know, it just was on my favorite of the large cats. Oh. Becky decided she wanted to live with leopard skin, despite the fact that she'd never actually seen a leopard. I've never really, you know, been next to one or even been in the vicinity. I've seen many of them on TV. I've seen many pictures. I have many pictures, you know, I just, uh, but have I been next to one? No. Today, Becky's taking her leopard look another step further. She's heading to her tattoo artist's home for her 16th tattooing session. I am having black leopard spots set on my ankles today. Got them done on my feet. And I really like the way they've been done on my feet, but I wanted a little bit more coverage around uh, both sides of my feet. I always put at least a month in, you know, in between. It's sometimes it can it can be up to two to two to three months in between, 
it's quite frequent to somebody who doesn't get tattooed. But um, I have quite a few friends that go in, you know, every other week and get tattooed. Becky met JJ, her tattooist, on her 18th birthday, the day she started getting her leopard spots. First day I met you, you tattooed me. Mm -hmm. The first spots that he did, the first half of my back, he just was looking at a picture of a leopard in a book. And ever since, we've just kind of gone with it. Yeah. <laughs> I just enjoy tattooing Becky. <laughs> I think what he's saying is he hates my tattoo. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Love her tattoo. <laughs> if, if I didn't, I, I wouldn't tattoo her. I'd, I'd make her go somewhere else. I thought we were going to stop with just the back, but but since then we've uh, we've journeyed uh, just about everywhere. No two spots are ever the same. Wow, your hair's getting long. It's looking good. Catman's dropped by the hairdressers for a cut and color. He's brought a picture along to show his stylist what he's after. It's a photo of a tiger. I've done, you know, different things on people with the tiger print and the leopard print and stuff like that. Very popular nowadays, especially... It's just come very trendy, I think. So how's the tail working out? Are you gonna oh, the to tail get bionic is, or? It, it already is. It already is bionic? Wow. Wow. I have a uh, animatronic uh, tail. It's a belt on tail that uh, is as close as I can come to a tail right now. Cat's bionic tail is covered in fun fur and powered by four AA batteries. He makes it move by a simple handheld control panel. A uh, friend of mine, uh, Wolf Tail, developed this. It'll raise up for going up and down stairs or for a raised tail situation and lay straight. It has two different speeds and two different positions it'll run and fully programmable. That's my tail. Let go of my tail. Cat's tail was built by an electrical engineer in Indianapolis who goes by the name Wolf Tail, or just Wolf for short. Two or three years ago for Halloween, I uh, built a non-animatronic, just standard Wolf Tail. That, and then, because I'm an electrical engineer, I needed to be able to, you know, one up on that. The next year, I built the original prototype animatronic tail. As you can see, it is just a simple cable pull system. So when this rotates, it generates a curl on the tail. And for a wag, you just move it back and forth in time with its oscillating frequency. And that gives you a good wag. I built another one, and I, uh, just wanted to see how much somebody would pay for one of these. So I went and I put it up on auction. It was much better than this one. And I put it up on auction and it sold for $400. So I was, well, I, I could actually like make some money that way. Encouraged by his first tail sale, Wolf turned his electrical engineering skills to something considerably more ambitious. The next logical step was to build an animatronic wolf head. jaw opens and closes. The uh, lips will uh, raise and lower, the nose raises and lowers, and the ears, well, they can uh, tilt left, right, forward and back, and then they can rotate. The entire wolf head is all built out of paper clips, just like the tail is. You see the eyes, they're, uh, the lenses are prescription lenses, because they need to wear lenses. After he built himself a head and tail, Wolf realized he needed one last thing to complete his transformation for Manta Wolf. He needed a fursuit. The next one will be a lot more realistic than this one, yeah. I can't howl pretty good. <clears throat> Other neighbors are going to kill me, though.
there's a dog that they'll blame it on that lives over there. I don't travel in a pack, but I've heard that there are other packs in, you know, around the United States and stuff, but there's not really that many in Indiana, if any. I'd say probably didn't start, you know, really expressing it until you get into college. You know, you move out of home and that kind of stuff. My parents, they know I build animatronic stuff. They know that I've been doing it. Um, I don't think they grasp <laughs> exactly what it is I do, but, you know, there's gotta be some things that your parents don't need to know about you, I guess. I mean, everybody's got that. I would hope that, you know, the woman that I do, that I eventually or hopefully will meet would be somewhat on the same, maybe, you know, I don't know, like, you know, kind of like wolf-like, I guess, I don't know. Kind of like me, I guess, just, you know, everybody's looking for a mate that's pretty much the same as what they are, right? <laughs> As soon as I realized to myself that I was a fur and that I connected with tigers, I wanted to tell the world because I knew that it made me happy and my parents, my friends, everybody that cares about me, you know, they want to know, they want to see that I'm happy. So I'm more than happy to share with people that, you know, tigers is what gets me going every day. Snap calls himself a furry someone who likes to dress up in a fursuit resembling his or her inner animal. The animal Snap wants to look like is a tiger. Before I found furry, I was set to be married. Um, I was engaged to a lady I've been dating for probably four or five years. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that I did not feel the love for her that I thought I did. And then, I was on a search to find out what made me happy. And so that's where the tiger fit into the equation. All I know is that being surrounded with tigers and associating myself with tigers makes me happy. It makes me more of a complete person. Whenever I need to calm myself down, I just either think of a tiger in my head or I look at maybe one of these stuffed animals and it calms me down. It puts me in my own uh, place. The number one place furries hang out is cyberspace. The internet has spawned the development of a furry community. I would not have found the community without it. I would not have the friends, the lifelong friends that I have right now without it. Um, I can't imagine the furry community before the internet. I hang out in a chat room called Fursuit. It's a fursuit chat room. So this this is my lifeline here. This is all my, my buddies. In some respects, these are individuals who are getting some element of pleasure from what's felt to be sort of a uh, unrealistic or atypical kind of object. It really is only a problem if it's interfering with their ability to get along in the world. It may be difficult for them to get into a mature and healthy adult relationship because who would want to have a relationship with a tiger, for example? They would want to have a relationship with a husband. But wanting to dress as a furry tiger doesn't necessarily mean you've got a problem. But if it brings them in contact with uh, other people who have similar interests, if they're not taking advantage of other people, or using other people as objects for their own pleasure, then uh, who's to judge that? And it may not be something that uh, has to be regarded as uh, negative, for example, to society or to the individual. Mentally, on the inside of my head, I do live life as a tiger. But I also know when to turn it on and turn it off as far as showing it off to the world. OK, here we go. And now I'm a tiger. Sometimes, if I feel like being silly, I'll put on my tiger suit and go run around downtown in the shopping district just to get reactions from people. 
there's a rule when you're wearing costumes, you don't talk. So I have to show off my emotions by big gestures. So I get to act like a tiger. I can't talk because tigers don't talk. I'm gonna cry myself <laughs> And mentally, I begin to feel like I'm taking on the role or the persona of a tiger. I've never seen a tiger in a natural environment. My contact with tigers has been 100% in zoos and circuses. I'm extremely careful with the people I pick. Mostly older women. Oh, it leaves me feeling great. You know, I'm just on a high the rest of the day. It really tires me out, and I'm real sweaty and stinky afterwards, but uh, it gives me a real good feeling. But the only thing that's that different from most people is my diet is almost exclusively meat. I'm on a carnivore diet. Uh, ground beef. Tigers generally eat meat. Hamburger I cook, other meat I eat pretty close to raw. It's a tiger thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Whenever possible, Cat prefers to eat meat that he's killed himself. Like any cat, he loves to hunt. I like it uh, out here where it's a little more open, a little quieter, fewer people uh, questioning what you do or why. Not like a, a real social kind of cat. Uh, I can take or leave people. I really don't seek them out. I really don't have any need to interact with people. Some coyote droppings. They're fairly old, several weeks old. Some deer tracks over here, but not very fresh ones. They're also uh, a week or so old. Maybe we'll get lucky and catch something fresher up here. As a Native American, Cat's tribes are Lakota and Huron, and his totem animal is the cat. Over 20 years ago, he began the process of transforming himself into a tiger, trying to become more like his totem. I'm following a very old Huron tradition that isn't done often anymore. Many years ago, my people would take and uh, transform themselves in various manners with masks or with uh, very crude surgeries or uh, with uh, uh, costuming, uh, get closer to the appearance of their totem. Not every day you would dress as your totem, but for ceremonial occasions, you might wear something that belongs to that totem or that represents that totem. You might have a, have a sign outside of your house, something that represents that totem. This cat man who has had his body transformed to take on more cat-like characteristics, I think it's definitely something that, that is very personal to him and very idiosyncratic. It's not something, I don't think that any other Native Americans would accept that as being indicative of a Native American religion. As a child growing up in the Midwest, Cat rebelled against his Native American heritage. He left his hometown and joined the Navy. Eventually, he realized that it wasn't the life he wanted. I, like, uh, was kind of wandering around with no real direction. And uh, I think the reason why I was unhappy is because uh, I hadn't decided to do what I needed to do. When I finally made a decision as to what I was going to do and what I had to do, everything started coming together. And this is what I had to do. As night falls in Scottsdale, Arizona, leopard girl Becky nears the end of her latest tattooing session. More black spots. Today, it's her ankles. It kind of tickles and like, I'll hit my spot and my foot in like one spot and it'll tickle for like a split, like half a second. <laughs> and then it just hurts. So it's kind of ticklish. It's like that pain that feels good. <laughs> I think she's like hitting delirium or something. <laughs> Becky's endorphin rush is kicking in and helping her cope with the pain. She claims you have to have a thick skin to wear a leopard spot tattoo and not just because of the needles. 
There's a lot of um, very extreme um, opinionated people out there that feel that I am you know, destroying my body and that I'm angry at the world and this is how I'm showing everybody. But it's not true. You know, I've had people just like rip their children, you know, from me and and you know mumble under their breath about you know. I'm, I'm some sort of Satan worshiper, you know, oh my gosh, you know, I, I kill small children in my backyard, so. Oh, look at that, that's so pretty. Ta-da. 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 That foot's done. Oh, yeah, I love it. I love it a lot. It looks very alien. You know, everyone has their own form of therapy. Getting modified has been the, one of the most positive reinforcements of my entire life. Thank you. I'm very happy with myself now. Someday I could see having my ears pointed and my earlobes removed. I've always wanted just a slight stretch on my eyes, but you know, that's, that's something that I don't see getting until you know, I'm ready for facelift, <laughs> you know? Might as well take care of all of that at once. <laughs> it's early morning in San Diego, and Kat's flying to Phoenix. He's scheduled for another operation he hopes will make him look even more tiger-like. This time, it's eyebrow whiskers. Uh, I've been wanting to do it for quite a while, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully I won't have uh, uh, too much swelling around my eyes. It could happen now. Uh, forehead work is... Uh, Pretty intense. There will be no anesthetic for today's operation. That's because the man performing the procedure isn't a doctor. Steve Hayworth's background is in medical instrument and implant manufacturing, not surgery. Today we're going to do uh, six transdermal implants in Cat's forehead for the purpose of connecting what will look like uh, whiskers. Cats also have eyebrow whiskers, kind of like their facial whiskers. And we're doing a set of eyebrow whiskers on Cat to help him achieve even more of that cat-like effect. Cat would not have been able to go to a surgeon in the US to get the work that he has. If a surgeon were to actually perform the kind of work that I, that I perform, they would lose their license because the American Medical Association says that modifying the body away from what society considers normal is unethical. Many medical experts believe procedures like the one Steve Hayworth performs can be dangerous to the patient and the doctor. I don't feel uh, as a cosmetic surgeon that I should be altering the human body to make them look like an animal or another figure. I think, first of all, these procedures are dangerous. I think they're completely unethical. And I feel it's my goal and my objectives to protect the patient from themselves, if you will, to make sure that they don't do something that they're going to regret either now or in the future. As an artist and a practitioner of body modification, my sole goal is to make people more unique and more away from what society considers normal. So I work under a different code of ethics. The first step is to mark out where the implants will sit. Steve knows he has to get it right. Can you turn on that? Kat knows the exact position for correct tiger eyebrows. Yeah, that's it. One of, the, uh, one of the things that we were shooting for here is anatomically on a cat, the whiskers aren't anywhere near the eyebrow whiskers like on a human. They're actually much higher and much more towards the center of the head. So cat's wanting to follow as closely to a feline as possible. Okay. So that would be the, the appropriate location. They're not exactly eyebrow whiskers. Exactly. They, they set the outside limits of the head. Right. If a cat can get their head through a hole, they can get their entire body through the hole. Well, somebody walked into a plastic surgeon's office with a picture of a tiger and said that I wanted to be like a tiger, um, I would be somewhat concerned about that. I would want to screen that individual first to see whether there are any recognized psychiatric conditions 
that might uh, lead to that person having a bad outcome with surgery. They may feel that they've been damaged. They may not have attained their idealized uh, vision of beauty, for example. They can be so upset that they may come back and sue their surgeon, or there have been a number of cases of people coming back enraged, really, uh, to the point where they've shot their surgeons. He was uh, incredibly frustrated when I first met him that he was not able to progress in the way that he wanted to progress with his modifications. He was very introverted, very withdrawn. And over the years, as we've proceeded to bring his modifications along, he has become more and more um, well-rounded and balanced. Because Steve isn't a doctor, he can't administer an anesthetic. Cat must endure the pain. Okay. And uh, just relax. And it's a moment of pain for a lifetime of pleasure. Great big deep breath in. Great big exhale. Here we go. Not all animal imitators feel the need to transform their bodies. Some just accept they're an animal trapped inside a human skin. I feel that I'm a coyote who, for whatever reason, has been born in a human body uh, to live a human life. John Osborne has legally changed his name to Coyote Osborne. He believes he's a weird coyote, a creature with the body of a human, but the spirit of a coyote. Unless I'm completely delusional, uh, I have uh, I have recollections of having lived as a coyote, as having lived as an animal many times. I guess I just had started to have enough of these recollections and memories, and sometimes I remember bits and pieces of things in dreams. But it just all sort of started to come together. Uh, I guess when I was about 16 or 17. At first, Coyote wondered if he might be a weird wolf. The first thing, of course, I was, I looked up was werewolf legends and things like that. That didn't really seem to fit. Uh, so I read up about the animals themselves, uh, wolves and coyotes and other canids, and um, kind of put two and two together. Like, well, no, this is what I was seeing and this is what I was remembering. There's a lot of times that I really don't feel very human at all, other than that I act and talk like one and, and have to pass for one in society. Uh, I feel like I've spent a lot of time artificially learning ways to act so that I won't seem weird to other people. Well, where basically means that it is an animal-human connection, but it's not something that is, it's looked upon something as it's something that's fearful. It's not something that is appropriate because it's as though that person has crossed the line. Uh, a were coyote is not someone that you'd want to be around. But in any culture, some people love pushing the limit and want to live their lives on the edge. Someone would want to be a were coyote because it would be very distinctive, it would be very powerful, um, it would be beyond the pale. It would not be something that would be appropriate. Although Coyote doesn't see himself as a weir in the traditional sense, he does have a mask that he uses for his own spiritual ceremonies. Um, it's actually made largely of uh, paper mache. The hood on the back to cover up my hair is leather. I'm eventually going to put horse hair onto it to be a mane like a coyote would have uh, and probably dye that. Masks would be done, would be used for special ceremonies. And when you put on a mask, you're taking on the persona of whatever it is that you're impersonating. And that spirit comes into you as a person. And it, so it would be done for a very specific uh, ceremonial purpose. When I'm using it spiritually or, you know, at a dance or a festival or something like that, uh, I would say yes, I do feel different with it on. So I probably look quite foolish, but I've never been that concerned. 
There are wild coyotes living in the neighborhood, but coyote doesn't run with them. You can hear them, uh, and I've seen one in the area. Uh, and of course, they howl and, and create a ruckus, and sometimes I howl and make a ruckus back. But I don't think they like how I sound. <laughs> I don't go out and meet them. They don't, they don't come running up to me and talk to me and treat me like a long lost friend. Uh, a lot of times, really, they're not going to do that with each other either. Coyote wanted to express his inner animal without undergoing surgery. So he picked up a pencil and started to draw. I think, at least for wares, uh, the reason that the drawing is a big thing because it's not like you can go and take a photograph of an anthropomorphic wear creature because there aren't any that look like this. Uh, so I think people use drawing because they want to say, this is what I feel like I am inside. This is what I would look like if I were really me. It's always weird for me somehow when I look in the mirror and I see this, this primate. And there's nothing wrong with primates except that I'm not one. I think that if there were any if there were any type of medical operation that could really realistically make me have animal traits, uh, I would do that. But uh, as it stands now, it seems to me like it's, it's purely cosmetic. Uh, I'm not going to grow fur. I'm not going to have the muscles or reflexes or probably even many of the instincts that an animal would have. Cat, you're amazing. That was not easy. Like anything else, it's, you get through it. Catman's in Steve Hayworth's operating room, getting eyebrow whisker implants with no anesthetic. It's been a very painful hour, but Steve's nearly done. Steve's implanted six small metal bolts into Cat's forehead. When the implants heal, Cat can screw nylon whiskers into the small bolts, giving himself tiger-like eyebrows. You actually bled very little. Really? I would think the capillaries in that area would uh... Usually forehead work is bloody, but yeah. this t tonight was the exception. All right, take a peek, cat. You're just trying to figure out where I'm at. All right. Those look good. One of the only people that I've ever met that has been disappointed about their modifications is cat. He's always, or not, not as much now, but after we'd get done with, with the procedure, he'd get up and he'd look in the mirror and he'd go, it's not happening fast enough. He, he would always be so upset and frustrated that we couldn't do more. Cat wants to attach the nylon whiskers to the implants like tonight. Uh, what do you think about the whiskers? Thank you. I, uh, I'm thinking that we're probably not going Too to close. Be able to do the yeah, whiskers. Too much swelling? But Steve feels they should wait until his forehead's healed. Yeah. Another five to okay. 10 days. You don't have to wait until the swelling goes down. We'd lose the... Uh, We'd lose the piercing. Yeah, we, we would lose the opening if we removed the uh, healing nubs right now. As soon as I get something done, it's a matter of, okay, what can I do next? I would like to have fur. Whenever it becomes possible, I want to uh, uh, do regular fur, conventional tiger fur, but uh, I don't know when that's going to happen. It's, uh, there's actually a fair amount of people working on it, uh, biological engineers, uh, geneticists, but uh, no progress as yet. I, he talks about the fur. I haven't talked to him about the fur. That's not my area of uh, expertise, so I really don't know anything about it. It would be an implant procedure, I'm sure, but uh, or a grafting procedure, but uh, it's a matter of finding uh, uh, something that can be genetically matched and that will work. I, I don't see how it could. Not real fur. Not any kind of a living, growing fur. Meanwhile, in Austin, Texas, it's standing room only to see the human lizard. All right, Austin, how you doing? Eric Sprague's in the process of covering his body in green scales. So far, the tattooing's taken over 700 hours, but that's just the start. I've had subdermal implants placed on my skull above each eye, five pieces of Teflon. 
my teeth file down to sharpen point, and of course my tongue split. Eric may have decided he wants to look like a lizard, but he's very careful to point out he doesn't think he's a lizard. I don't think about myself as being a lizard being, I mean, lizards have brains the size of the walnut. <laughs> you know, they're not, I don't think of myself as, as that, as an animal. I'm a human being, I'm an artist. I just happen to like lizards. A lot of it is just a, a personal sort of thing. I like reptiles, I do their dog people, cat people, whatever. I, I like snakes and lizards, especially in terms of look. So yeah, I just, I wanted to be green. That's off my eyes. Eric's bizarre look also helps him with his claim he's one of the world's most extreme sideshow acts. My show is a collection of what are usually thought of traditionally as sideshow style acts. A lot of them do come from different places, but here in, in the West, we usually think of them as sideshow acts because that's where they were introduced to our culture. In the past, animal imitators often worked in circus sideshows, but most of them weren't really imitating animals. They were earning a living from their bizarre and often tragic disabilities. In the past, you've had very famous performers who get into animal acts, and often it is based on a medical condition uh, or a deformity. And it is a collaboration between the owner of the sideshow and the performer in how to package that deformity, how to make it titillating, but also acceptable. Outraged citizens attack the sideshows for encouraging people to laugh at so-called freaks of nature. Their protests helped put an end to the sideshow. So did modern medicine. Modern science has had a real effect on the sideshow. Medical care in the 20th century eliminated a lot of the freaks of nature. But as the 21st century arrived, so did a new kind of freak, the self-inflicted freak and the sideshow was back in business. Well, you know, things have changed even in my 25 years in the business, and you know what? In this day and age, freaks are cool. Uh, freaks are out there, they are the new rebels. Freaks are like rock and rollers. Freaks are like movie stars. You want to be a freak, get your freak on. This is where you're most likely to see me die on stage tonight. I as often build myself as one of the single most complete sideshow freaks in history. It's taken a lot of work for me to be the freak that I am. It used to be I was a, a freak in normal clothes and you didn't know until you got to know me. Now you can take one look and you can tell you're dealing with a freak. I'm a freak, not an illusionist. Everything I do is real. And Eric is a very intellectual young man who has a master's in philosophy, and he made a very intellectual decision in school to move into sideshow arts. But he's not any South American or anything. The show's finale is an extreme stunt involving a small snake Eric puts up his nose. Most of the time, the number one priority is to entertain. Um, and to hopefully entertain in such a way that it might be thought-provoking, but I will settle for a simple, yeah, I had a good time. Thank you very much. I like knowing that if I walk to the grocery store and someone's driving by, they see the green man. They see, they see the human lizard, or whatever it is that they think they see and that they do see. It breaks up their day. That little surreal touch and snap them out of it for a second. And like I say, give them that sense of awe, that sense of inspiration, hopefully, that's similar to like when you were a little kid again. Every year, America's furry community congregates in Chicago for their annual Midwest Fur Convention, a strictly private affair where no cameras are permitted. The weekend's going to be full of action and not a lot of sleep. I really don't want to go too much into the convention, but you know, when people go to these furry conventions, sometimes it's bragging rights as far as who can make the better looking animal suit or who can make the more realistic one or who even can act the best inside of it. 
I spend most of my time at the convention out of suit, not only because I'm busy running around trying to see my friends that are there, plus there are certain panels that I put on uh, showing how to act in fursuit, how to make the fursuits. Um, so I, I'd say only about 10% of the time I'm actually in my fursuit. Catman's also in town for the conference. He doesn't consider himself a fur, but he's made many furry friends online. For him, the convention's a chance to hang out with other human tigers. One will be Snap. The two fellow tigers have become good friends online. Today, they'll finally meet face to face. I'm, as a rule, not really one to become friends with somebody kind of in the way that we had, but uh, it's like we speak the same language. We're both tigers, first of all, okay? You know, it's, Where's Snap? I should have been here already. Well, I'm sure when I see him, you'll have to pick my job off the ground, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming into this expecting a certain amount of shock value, I suppose you can call it that. Nice oh, to see you. Nice to see you, too. All right, rock right. on. <clears throat> what you got going on there? OK, picked it up in uh, Munich. Oh, very cool. <laughs> I figured a plushie would work, eh? That is cool. I dig that. Oh, yeah. boy. It was really interesting seeing him. Rock on. Thanks a lot, man. Cool. All right. You know, I just couldn't stop staring at the stitches in his head, because I know how much that must have hurt. It's only been four days since Cat had the six metal bolts implanted in his forehead. Once healed, the bolts will have nylon whiskers attached, giving Cat tiger-like eyebrow whiskers. Is that still pretty tender up there? Uh, it's not too bad. Yeah. Uh, like, next day or two, I'll be pulling the stitches out there. Uh, you don't even notice the stitches. I mean, it just kind of looks like hair sticking They out. need to get pulled out, though, real yeah. soon. Oh, yeah. I think I'm going to want to have a closer look at his ears and at the stuff in his forehead, you know, just to give me a constant reminder that that's something I'm not going to want to do in the future. So good cool. to see you. So good, good to see, to see you, see too. You. And I've been waiting for this for a long time. Together, the tigers head for the sanctuary of their private fur fest. The furries realize that the rest of the world finds them more than a little strange. But psychiatrists say being a little weird doesn't necessarily mean you've got a disorder. Many people would think of uh, punk rockers, for example, as being odd you know, in terms of their appearance, but not necessarily a disorder. And the other point being that they're accepted within their subculture. There are other individuals who share some similar passions, thoughts, urges, and fashion. And so they're, they're not really isolated or alone. It's now been two months since Cat had small metal bolts implanted in his forehead. The surgical wounds have healed. Now, Cat can screw in his nylon whiskers and enjoy his long-awaited tiger's eyebrows. Oh, uh, they came out really well. They feel good. They actually work. I can feel them. I could actually uh, walk around in the dark and make sure I didn't bump my head against anything. They do actually work the way that whiskers work. Cat's happy with his new eyebrows but he's far from ready to declare himself transformed into a tiger. Well, I'm still looking for somebody who can do fur. I'm still looking for somebody who can do uh, other uh, portions of my transformation. I'm, I'm never gonna stop looking. I'm gonna continue to try to get done what I can get done. Push the envelope on uh, where technology is today.